Uh, thank you very much, Ben. I, I believe we can start uh, now this meeting. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to uh, this uh, dialogue series um, in the International Migration Review uh, Forum. Um, on behalf of the Roundtable 3 colleagues, uh, the World Health Organization, United Cities and Local Governments that I represent, and the Major Group for the Children and Youth, I would like to acknowledge uh, the continued support of the Secretariat of the UN Migration Network and really warmly welcome you. And in advance, already thank you for all the contributions that you have made for um, helping us um, at shaping the preliminary messages and from wanting to participate and, and provide additional inputs. And this is why we come uh, together here uh, today. Um, we've got a lot of people that have reached out in advance, uh, letting us know that they that they wanted to contribute specifically. And allow me to get some household messages out of the way uh, before we formally uh, start. Um, uh, as you know, uh, this event is going to be recorded so that it's easier for us to take uh, the key messages and, and conclusions. Um, and what we are trying to get out of this consultation is concrete cases, concrete example or, or a specific inputs uh, uh, for, uh, for the um, documents uh, that we are preparing uh, together. Uh, and you know that the network uh, with support from this group has drafted a preliminary note, I am sure you all read it, um, in the progress of the implementation of the relevant objectives of, uh, that we cover in this roundtable three. And we have prepared guiding questions of which we hope are, are useful. So uh, together with the online discussion a space uh, set up by the network and the hub repository, we encourage you to share concrete initiatives um, and, and this will form the basis for the network to finalize the background notes that are going to be submitted in around uh, three weeks um, ahead of the uh, um, review forum. A, a kind reminder that we also wanted to ensure that you are aware the, that, that uh, the meeting uh, dates have changed and it will now take place from the 17th to the 20th of May. This, this is important. And also we wanted to ensure that the SG report uh, that has been made available to member states and uh, stakeholders. Uh, the report is going to be launched officially on the 16th of February and, and the organizers really wanted to make sure um, that you were aware with, uh, with this. Um, while not wishing to uh, preempt the discussions, uh, we, we want to make sure um, that uh, the recommendations that we that we make uh, in, in, in during during these exchanges, um, um, they, they should be aiming to uh, to help us reach some of our shared goals, right? Uh, to achieve inclusive societies and the inclusion of migrants, um, particularly learning from everything that we have been able to share in these very special times that our world. Is, is facing. I mean, we all know that the COVID pandemic um, has, has made us realize that some people in our societies and in particular migrants um, are, are suffering uh, more than others. They are left out more than others, uh, that our systems are working uh, better for some and not for all, and that we need to make an effort to include everybody and leave no one behind. We have also learned, however, um, that we can do things better because there have been many temporary measures that can actually be very interesting building blocks, very interesting lessons for future uh, for future policy and we feel that some of the objectives and topics that we cover in this roundtable um three uh, can really benefit from from some of the experiences that we that we have gone through during this uh, COVID uh, pandemic. The constituency that I represent here, uh, the uh, local and regional governments are of course very attached to uh, service uh, provision. Local service provision is one of these, uh, these cornerstones for social inclusion and we feel that a lot of possibilities of transformation can 
are, are there to ensure that that migrants are included, that they are that they are empowered. Um, a lot can change, and and we think that we need to make concrete proposals based on the experience um, that we have had. So we look forward to uh, to hearing from you on this. We also want to. Um, to ensure um, that um, the the proposals that we make are are practical, uh, that they are far reaching, that they take into account not only the responsibility that we have for the current generation, but also uh, towards uh, sustainability for the future of our planet, and that they take into account some of the many emergencies that that we are facing. Um, legal frameworks will need to be modified if we want to ensure that uh, we all uh, progress. So I thank you very much for your attention and I am really delighted to give the floor now to um, a, a very important partner, a, a good colleague and friend, Elena Wong, who is the global focal point uh, for, um, for the youth uh, and, and children. Um, so I thank you again and I look forward to hearing from your commitments uh, and from your inputs to shape a strong messages together. Thank you again on behalf of United Cities and local governments, but also the World Health Organization and the Major Group for Children and Youth. Thank you again. Thank you, Secretary General, for the floor and for that warm introduction to what I hope will be a dynamic and productive consultation. On behalf of the Migration, Youth and Children platform, I'm honored to be here co-hosting with our colleagues from WHO, UCLG and the UN Network. For those who don't know us, my CP is a constituency of the major group for children and youth, ensuring the meaningful participation of youth and young migrants in migration governance. We are representing the voices of over 88,000 youth and youth-led organizations globally through capacity building and consultations at the national, regional and global levels. The objectives today focus around ensuring migrant access to essential protection, basic services, financial independence, and facilitated inclusion that aids their contributions. Objective 14, enhance consular protection, assistance, and cooperation through the migration cycle is essential to ensuring services are in place to reduce migrant vulnerability, such as providing proof of legal identity, timely accurate information, as well as supporting their engagement and development and safe, sustainable return and reintegration. The pandemic saw some successful examples of states strengthening this, but many gaps in efficacy and inclusivity remain, and it is crucial that these provisions are only expanded and continued past COVID-19. Objective 15, provide access to basic services for all migrants, has become more urgent than ever. Migrants continue to face legal and practical barriers to accessing physical and mental health care, housing, education, social and legal protection, and decent work. The COVID-19 vaccinations also demonstrate the need for equal and affordable access at the local level without risk of deportation or detention. It's crucial that firewalls against immigration enforcement when assessing such services are implemented and social protections and basic needs provided regardless of migratory status. Growing inequalities continue to hinder Objective 16, empower migrants and societies to realize full inclusion and social cohesion. To achieve this, many stakeholders highlighted the need for migrants to access employment opportunities, skill training and pathways to regularization. Whilst new initiatives such as Spain's National Observatory for Counting Xenophobia and Racism and the youth-driven xenophobic barometer in Colombia, Ecuador, Chile and Peru have made progress, xenophobia continues to plague communities. The pandemic highlighted the systemic link between migration, intersectional justice and the need to include migrant voices in decision-making and emergency response. As also undone, much progress in Objective 19, create conditions for migrants and diaspora to fully contribute to sustainable development in all countries, disrupting transnational cooperation opportunities. Stakeholders have called for meaningful migrant participation in the discussion, implementation, and monitoring of policies and practices that affect their lives and that of their origin countries. Initiatives such as Fondazioni for Africa in Uganda and Senegal showcase the value of diaspora engagement, yet migrant diaspora communities continue to have the potential limited. Whilst remittance flows did not significantly drop, and many states and stakeholders took actions to maintain progress on Objective 20, promote faster, safer, and cheaper transfer of remittances and foster financial inclusion of migrants, 
many migrant workers were subject to significant withholding of wages, loss of income, and a lack of safety nets and social protections during the pandemic. Civil society in particular has pushed for urgent attention to remedy this and the lack of legal, social, and financial support for migrant communities. Finally, several states have advanced agreements to achieve Objective 22, establish mechanisms for the portability of social security entitlements and earned benefits, but many have highlighted implementation gaps that require improved coordination. Similarly, stakeholders have called for the social protection for migrant workers and families, portability of social protections, and health coverage upon return. Today's interactivity and participation will not only enrich the discussion, but will be a crucial component in shaping the GCM and migration governance moving forward, as well as to truly reflect upon GCM implementation progress and ensure an inclusive and migrant-centered review process. I'm honored to now give the floor to our esteemed moderator, Santino Severin. I look forward to discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues, for this insightful uh, introduction. I'm Santino Severoni. I'm the director of the Alta Migration Program of the World Health Organization. And uh, I'm delighted and honored to be here today as a, a co-lead uh, member of this roundtable three uh, for the moderation and conclusion of this consultation. Let me start by sharing some uh, information for the uh, next panel. First, we will hear from three distinguished panelists to kick off the discussion. Each one will have five minutes to reply to one question. Subsequently, we will open the discussion for intervention from the floor. We thank those that have already reached us, uh, making us to know the intention to intervene. Uh, and we're looking forward to gather as many inputs as possible today also for, from the rest of the participants and audience. Let me kindly remind you that there is a limited time for this dialogue series, so I'm sorry if I'm going to uh, play the uh, timekeeper, uh, as I've been asked to keep the interventions from the floor within two minutes. And uh, only addressing the objectives under this roundtable, namely objective 14, 15, 16, 19, 20, 22, as uh, already just illustrated by uh, my colleague. Member states will be called to speak first. We also encourage participants to use the chat function to cover any message related to the objective in discussion today. Anything not covered today can be added in the discussion space, and then the secretary will share the link in the chat shortly. Uh, if you wish to intervene, please use the chat function for the, that effort. We won't be using the raise hand function. So please make us to know in the chat that you are booking to take the floor. And now, without further ado, I would like to start the panel by inviting the first distinguished panelist, His Excellency Ambassador Marc Bichelet, permanent representative, permanent mission of Luxembourg to the UN United Nations in Geneva. Uh, Excellency, from Luxembourg's experience, and as one of the champion countries for the GCM, what are the key actions that you have implemented to achieve Objective 15, and in particular in providing access to basic services to migrants, especially focusing on the inclusion of the health needs of migrants in national and local health care policy and plans? Ambassador Floss is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and I'm happy uh, to be here this afternoon, uh, dear all ladies and gentlemen. At the outside, uh, outset, let me uh, share some key statistics about my country as a background to our long-standing commitment to safe and regular migration and to the Global Compact for Migration as a whole. Almost half of Luxembourg's resident population was born abroad three quarters of which in another country of the European Union. With only 27% of jobs in Luxembourg being held by employees and workers of Luxembourgish descent, our economy is heavily dependent on foreign labor, especially in the health sector. 
uh, report published in 2021 found that since the early 2000s, Luxembourg has been one of the uh, OECD countries with the highest number of asylum seekers per capita surpassed only by, uh, by Greece in 2019. As you can see, migration is at the heart of Luxembourg's economic and social reality. And today I would like to focus my intervention on the public health care policies that Luxembourg has set in place for migrants and asylum seekers in line with Objective 15 of the GCM, which focuses on providing migrants with access to basic services. The right to health is a human right. Ensuring the physical and mental health of migrants therefore forms an important component of our national migration policies, which are guided by international human rights commitments and obligations. Within the first three months of their arrival in Luxembourg, uh, persons who are seeking international protection have access to a free medical checkup. After this period, they are entitled to access the national social security scheme in the same way than Luxembourgish residents. We are proud to say that the health care offered to vulnerable groups includes mental, and health, mental health and psychosocial support. In order to create a climate of trust and to reduce any communication barriers, a dedicated educator and an interpreter are provided to accompany underage applicants as well as women and girls when they receive psychosocial support. This is done in order to best identify and respond to their needs in a respectful, anonymous and appropriate manner. Ensuring that migrants' primary health needs are met is really high on the agenda of the Luxembourg authorities. Despite the barriers that the pandemic has imposed over the past two years, Luxembourg offers access to information on healthcare services in a gender responsive and non-discriminatory manner in line with Objective 15. Concrete examples of these information campaigns include the distribution of flyers, messages, and interactive information sessions on, no on social networks. The same information is also relayed by people who share the same community or ethnic background, as well as by the staff at the immigration service or in the asylum centers. And while striving to provide health care for all migrants, we have found that some migrant women and girls may be hesitant to seek out healthcare services for cultural or religious reasons. To reach those women and girls and to ensure a culturally sensitive service delivery, Luxembourg has set up an initiative aimed at preventing abuse and educating women and girls, including by working with well-respected women leaders from their community. These women can then pass on messages ranging from domestic violence, mutilation, sequestration, to forced marriage or unwanted pregnancy in a culturally sensitive way. This can be done in person or via social networks and telephone. Finally, I would like to stress that it is with a strong political will and a firm dedication to uphold international human rights commitments and obligations that we address the social health needs of vulnerable people arriving in Luxembourg and who seek international protection. Migrants and refugees are entitled to the same universal human rights and fundamental freedoms as everybody else. And it is the responsibility of the host country to respect, to protect and to fulfill these at all times. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Excellency, for this uh, rich uh, overview of the excellent work ongoing in your countries. We are really looking for good practices and good experiences to share further around the world because we firmly believe there is a lot of learning, cross-learning between countries' experiences, particularly in diffusing challenges in uh, protecting and including migrants and uh, refugees into national health uh, services and non-health services. Now, uh, I'd like to move to the uh, second panelist. I have the pleasure to introduce Mr. Mohamed Wakdi Aidi, Vice Minister, by, uh, sorry, Vice Mayor of uh, Sfax in uh, Tunisia. Um, Mr. Aidi, uh, from the perspective of lo local government, 
what have been the key challenges and opportunities facing the addressing the protection and inclusion of migrant community during the COVID-19 pandemics? The floor is yours, please. Shukran. Uh, shukran. Uh, Thank you. I would like uh, to uh, welcome all those who are with us uh, here today. It is uh, an honor for me to be participating in the name of my uh, city, Sparks from Tunisia, in this discussion that is uh, important. My city has already participated in submitting uh, uh, papers related to migration in uh, the MENA region. And I believe that uh, the participation of local communities and authorities is highly important uh, because migration is uh, related to urban and rural areas alike because cities essentially are uh, areas of transit and also a destination for many migrants and maybe the cities uh, have a different uh, uh, situation because uh, they should be at the heart of any policy or uh, governance or management of migration e issues. Sfax is a city from Tunisia, uh, in Tunisia, sorry, and it is the main uh, destination for migrants from uh, Libya, from Morocco, and especially from sub-Saharan African countries. And uh, when it comes to uh, the objectives uh, that we are discussing here is today, 15, 16, 2021, 20, our city has, um, don't, has faced uh, these challenges uh, uh, pertaining to these objectives, particularly when it comes uh, to uh, local management and governance. It's something new that we have been witnessing in our city. Since 2018, we have been facing a new decentralized uh, uh, approach, and uh, we have been working on setting a clear vision at the national level. But we do not have an official policy for migration. Our city welcomes thousands of migrants, particularly from sub-Saharan uh, uh, youth and uh, um, from different Mediterranean countries. Under COVID, we faced a lot of challenges because the services were almost uh, non-existent and uh, migrants were not benefiting from the services in place. More than 90% of migrants were illegal, irregular, and thus uh, we as local government, local authorities, we endeavor to provide services and assistance to these migrants and to empower them, whether having access to medical services in the city or even socially by providing them with assistance, direct aid and assistance to the migrant. And the IOM has played a very important and central role in providing such assistance. And also the UNHCR has also a prominent office in our city and has provided uh, the necessary uh, services to the migrants or asylum seekers. There was also a coordination, and this is something new that we have been facing with the civil society and civil society actors. We found that uh, we have uh, a high number of uh, CSOs in the city and these services that have been provided by uh, the civil society organizations was something new and the city uh, municipalities and uh, the local authorities have uh, established a new vision and have also focused on this initiative and given it a kind of a formal uh, aspect. So the local authorities and cities have an important role, a very important role to play in order uh, to provide uh, the necessary migrant, local migrant uh, policy and management as well as good governance. And we were able as such to be closer to the migrants and maybe to alleviate some of the challenges uh, and the difficulties that, that uh, the local communities uh, have been facing, as well as the migrants, uh, and also to try to diffuse uh, some of the stress that existed. Uh, um, but unfortunately, under COVID, uh, because of the integration policies and the policies that were in place to help uh, the migrants to be integrated in the local community, required uh, necessary or additional uh, 
services and the local communities didn't have sufficient resources to provide such uh, services. But given uh, our uh, partnership with the UCLG, we have uh, been benefiting from the experiences and success stories of our cities, of other cities. So despite all the challenges, we uh, have been able to learn and to provide better services to assist the migrants and help them in overcoming these difficult and dire circumstances with their, where they find themselves because they have lost their jobs, uh, their livelihood. And we were able to try to minimize and mitigate the impact of the pandemic on migrants. So this is to confirm that cities and local governments have an important role to play. They do play such an important role. And these uh, local authorities have to be included in uh, enacting and uh, adopting international policies. And uh, these authorities, as well as na local Sorry, national authorities need to uh, give more power and prerogatives to local communities so as to adopt official strategic policies for migration in the cities in order to allow for such an integration of migrants. And we try as much as possible to help migrants uh, uh, to cope with these new uh, circumstances, to overcome the challenges, to become regular migrants. And all of that, again, highlights the role of cities and go local governments, as well as the role of organizations that work with uh, cities uh, and uh, local governments such as the UCLG and the participation of cities again I repeat is important to ensure the development and going forward and providing services. Thank you thank you very much uh, Mr. Aidi uh, for this really uh, interesting report on the experience of the municipality of uh, Sfax and uh, the role of the municipalities in general. Uh, the pandemic response show clearly that there are there were and there are key interventions to fight the, the, the virus, which are non-health interventions, and many of them that were implemented the community or uh, local uh, authority uh, level. But also, I would like to undermine that the communities, in the support of what the, uh, Mr. Heidi was saying, the community and the municipality have been also ensuring keeping functioning essential services during the pandemic, and in many cases with a very important contribution of the mi migrant population together with the resident population. I'm now moving to the last but not the least uh, panelist, uh, Ms. Yosra Kallali which is Young Policy Network on uh, Migration of the German Marshall Fund. Um, Ms. Kallali, I would like to ask you from the youth perspective, what are some good practices, existing programs and mechanisms already in place that support, encourage and empower youth migrant integration into decision making and contribution to development? What should be put in place to ensure universal access to rights and service without discrimination? Please, Epi, if you can share your experience and your views. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, esteemed ambassadors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Severino, for the floor. Uh, and um, allow me first to extend a warm thanks to the, to the UN Network on Migration, to WHO, uh, to the uh, MYACP uh, and also uh, UCLG for conducting this conversation as a, a preparatory event to the uh, International Migration Review Forum, uh, especially to highlight the good practices and mechanisms uh, of support to migrants that contribute to sustainable development across the globe and mainly uh, across the continent, the African country, uh, the country, country which I'm focusing on uh, during my uh, intervention. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually um, my honor uh, as a researcher and also as a practitioner uh, being part of the Young Policy Network on Migration uh, with the German Marshall Fund uh, of the United States, as well also uh, as previously uh, working with the African Union Commission and GIZ African Union uh, in implementing the migration policy framework for Africa uh, within both organizations and uh, as currently working as well with the African Union Commission as project officer uh, to implement uh, poly regional policies and frameworks on sexual reproductive health rights for youth, uh, not only 
uh, for youth across the continent and in particular also for uh, migrants, uh, youth and, and, and women uh, in Africa. Um, it's an opportunity for me to share with you some of the African Union policies and, and frameworks and programs as well that uh, push for migrants inclusion and, and contribution to the sustainable development of the conference. Uh, and this conversation is definitely another opportunity for us to spotlight the, ro the role of youth um, especially uh, migrants in, in uh, achieving the SDG goals and also contributing to uh, decision making processes to change the narratives uh, around different topics. Uh, as you might know, uh, all of you migration in Africa is due to um, multiplicity of factors that include the need for improved uh, socioeconomic conditions through employment, through envir uh, environmental factors, as well also uh, this, uh, aside from political instability, conflict, and strife in the continent. Uh, the continent is also uh, was witnessing changing patterns uh, of migration, which reflected in the, um, in the feminization of migration and also the high numbers uh, of youth. Um, as you might know as well, for young migrants, both regular and also irregular, and in particular, uh, their health and also their well-being, uh, their access to information are a crucial part uh, of their lives. And uh, the knowledge and awareness of young people of the legal framework and policies uh, in their continent, uh, in their also respective countries, um, and their knowledge as well of the agreements at national and regional and international levels uh, related to education, uh, to employment, and also to their engagement is, is really necessary and will enable them to make more informed decisions regarding their lives and also uh, knowing their rights. It's therefore uh, important from my perspective as an African uh, young person who's involved in policy development processes uh, within the African Union Commission, and also important for all African and, and young people and women, uh, migrants across the globe to have access to these regional and global uh, processes to influence their outcomes. To enhance uh, intersectional engagement and access to official and also informal negotiation and discussion spaces, addressing uh, their rights and their will to contribute to decision making process at both regional and also interna international levels. Uh, it's important to mention here the African Union's Migration Policy Framework for Africa, NPFA, which is considered uh, one of the continental frameworks that has been developed to enable the continent to better manage and benefit from planned migration by providing strategic guidelines to member states and also to the regional economic communities uh, in the management of migration through uh, the formulation and also the implementation of their own national and regional migration policies in accordance with their priorities and also resources. The framework as well, it covers the various challenges of the migration phenomenon, it, uh, its roots, uh, its roots codes, and also in relationship to development, uh, the brain drain problem, and also the migrants uh, on the continent. It provides as well uh, a non-binding legal framework calling on member states to link their migration policies to development needs and also uh, to the protection of migrants' rights. And we can also mention as well the efforts of the African Union Commission, uh, mainly the Social Affairs Department, a previously called, that promotes the work uh, of, the, uh, of the organization in migration, in labor and employment, and also uh, the, the political affairs department, which, is, which are working with member states, with civil society organizations, and also with key stakeholders to implement the African Union protocol on free movement of persons, rights of residents, and rights of establishments. It also responds to the AU priority, including migrants in the development and regional integration process. One of the key initiatives also that I can mention today to ensure the promotion of research and data collection on migration, which is one of the, uh, our Young Policy Network migration um, objectives, is to conduct and also to constitute a network of young people who, uh, who are doing their researches, who are doing their work on migration studies uh, across the globe, across the continent as well. And uh, this is uh, to reinforce the African Union efforts to establish a center for the study and the research on migration. The first one was in Mali, and which was also followed by the integration of the African Migration Observatory, uh, which, has, uh, which was launched in, in Morocco um, last year. 
As much as uh, these policies are, are important, uh, they are also um, relevant yeah, to... Uh... <clears throat> Sorry, can you hear me? Great. So as much as uh, these policies are important, as I mentioned, the meaningful participation of, of migrants and also uh, in decision making processes, it's a question of law and policy uh, indeed. And several initiatives have been implemented to ensure migrants inclusion in the decision making process, especially at local level. And here I can mention exam, uh, especially the example of my country, Tunisia, as well as uh, the previous panelist also from uh, the mayor of, of um, the lo local um, the local municipality from Insfakus uh, mentioned this as well that many local uh, initiatives were um, concreted uh, working concrete actions actually to reduce the vulnerabilities of, of very migrant and displaced uh, child living within uh, their jurisdictions regardless of their uh, of their status not only uh, on their own, but also in partnership with the regional and national authorities and other stakeholders uh, through the transfer of successful models, uh, lessons learned, and also the planning strategies to improve uh, city responses for migrants and also displaced, uh, displaced children and persons. Um, local governments as well um, are wor we're working on accelerating the efforts to implement the Global Compact for Migration at national level, as well as also the Global Compact on Refugees to the benefit of, of uh, children, communities and, and, cities, and cities. In Tunisia, uh, in my home country, local municipalities and authorities, not only in Sfakis as uh, um, but also in the different regions included migrants residents in some of the national consultations as well also provided support to migrants to have access to health and education services and programs. And this was facilitated as well through the civil society organizations that migrants today, uh, we can say that we have a database for regions of the uh, who may benefit from the languages program and also trainings to facilitate to facilitate their inclusion, also their integration uh, in the community. I'm concluding uh, by um, my my uh, intervention here actually by extending um, my very warm appreciation to all of the speakers. Uh, present here, I'm sure also that the discussion will, will continue, and uh, and most importantly that. Uh, to have such conversations which uh, will allow us to understand more the, the ch to change the narratives as well about uh, migration uh, phenomena in the, in the globe and also in Africa. And I hope this discussion uh, will be successful uh, in exchange experiences and other best practices that we can learn from uh, and uh, to ensure especially migrants integration in the policy and decision making processes. Uh, I wish us, uh, all of us, fruitful deliberations and, and also a successful outcome of, of the work we are embarking on. I thank you all, and I will hand over to you, Mr. Santino. Thank you, Ms. Callali. Thank you for this rich uh, updating on the uh, active engagement of youth association and networks. Indeed, we need you. Indeed, we need you more. If I'm comparing what's going on in the climate change uh, area, uh, I really wish that youth can help us in moving the agenda of uh, migration uh, further with, a, with the same determination. So thank you very much for your great work and the work that all your colleagues are doing uh, in each country. Now I would like to uh, open for the contribution from the floor. Uh, I'm having a quite good list of uh, uh, speakers. Um, I'd like to start with His Excellency, Mr. Paul Raymond Cortes, representative of uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Philippines, uh, and will be followed uh, by representative of Mexico. Uh, please, Dr. Cortes, uh, Mr. Cortes, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Santino. Uh, good evening uh, from the Philippines. The Philippines is very privileged to join today's roundtable discussion on supporting the integration of migrants and their contribution to development. Indeed, the adoption of the GCM has paved pathways for these timely and necessary discussions as we support the integration of migrants and their contributions to development. Now, as a country of origin, the Philippines recognizes the impact 
of our 10 million overseas Filipino migrants uh, in terms of national development. Their remittances in 2020 alone has totaled about 9.6% of our country's GDP. They not only support their families back home, but they also and equally contribute to the positive development of the host countries as they provide talents, ideas, and manpower to the local economy. Thus, the Philippines remains very proactive in responding to the social integration of migrants by paying particular attention to providing consular assistance, access to health services, and social security entitlements of these migrants, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID crisis was an enormous challenge to uh, migrants, and the provision of consular services amidst this pandemic has forced governments to find more efficient ways to deliver these services. Uh, In terms of the Department of Foreign Affairs of the Philippines, they developed innovative solutions towards better and effective services both to our Filipinos here at home and to those overseas. Online services and management systems for consular transactions were improved and strengthened. For instance, following the Philippines signing of the Apostille Convention, the process of authenticating public documents in the Philippines to be used in foreign countries has become so much more simplified. Uh, Within the ASEAN region, uh, improving consular assistance comes with two important declarations. First is the guidelines on consular assistance by ASEAN member states' missions in third countries to nationals of other ASEAN member states, and second, the ASEAN Travel Corridor Arrangement Framework, both of which facilitate the essential movement of people in the region while taking into account uh, measures to combat the global health crisis. Uh, Time and again, we echo the UN Secretary General's message in addressing the pandemic. No one is safe until everyone is safe. In this light, the Philippines has been relentless in in ensuring a quick and efficient rollout of its vaccination program and the further issuance of the WHO agreed International Certificate of Vaccination and Prophylaxis. The VaxCert PH is also compliant with international health standards, taking off from the recommendations of the WHO Smart Vaccination Certification Working Group issued last year. Well, this is because we believe that access to vaccination, regardless of nationality and status, must be ensured by the governments as we endeavor to resume mobility for trade and other economic activities. Finally, the Philippines believes in focusing on the social protection of migrants. Since the adoption of the GCM, the Philippines has entered into bilateral social security agreements with other states, and thus far we have signed 15 such agreements with various destination countries. These agreements enabled the reduction of vulnerabilities of stranded migrants during this period of uncertainty. Colleagues of Philippines strongly advocates for all forms of protection afforded to migrants. For this reason, we encourage member states, particularly countries of destination, to provide the most basic services to migrants with little or no cost so that migrants are not left in limbo. And as migrants continue to contribute to the global development, the Philippines maintains and advances its aspirations to ensuring a safe, orderly, and regular migration for all migrants wherever and whenever. Thank you very much, Marami Salamat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippines. And uh, now the floor to Representative of Mexico with a plea of uh, the two minutes uh, time uh, respect. Uh, Mexico forces you. Muchas gracias. Muy buenos días a todas. Thank you very much. Good morning. I would like to share some of the good practices we've been doing in Mexico according to the different objectives we are dealing with today. In Mexico, we have many challenges, as most of the colleagues here in the call, from as if you are from the region, you know that well. But we also have a very important role in the GCM and also in the following up of the objectives. We've been very exhaustive in order to see the different advances and the strengths and the weakness that we have. This is something we've done from the government. I'm glad to share with you some of the good practices. 
in protection and con consular protection is one of our strengths. Thanks to our external relations department, we've been working a lot in consular protection, specifically in the States. In the United States, we have 50 consulates there. I think it's the biggest network and our capacity there is very wide. But not only in terms of capacity, also in terms of the dialogue we can establish. Since 2013 with the United States, we also have these relationships with embassies in Central America. We have a, di a constant dialogue from Mexico City in order to improve the consular protection and so that all authorities are in direct contact with all those representations. We have regional agreements for consular cooperation. We have specific uh, partnerships and the regional conference about migration, just as two examples. In terms of access to basic services, Objective 15, we have a list of services provided by the state. We have social security for state workers. We have a national commission as well. For emergencies, we generated holistic plans for migrant, and we also have mental, uh, mental health programs for migrant people in our country. In terms of uh, education, we try to guarantee that all children go to school from basic preschooling and also to high school. We've been advancing a lot in that field. I will be able to share that with you in another call. And I would also like to mention that we have a strategy in our vaccination national plan, so to include all people, also migrants against COVID-19, independent, regardless of their migrant status. All these good practices have their challenges, especially for migrants in transit. Most of them don't want to stay in Mexico, so the services we make available for them sometimes are not accepted, and this is one of the main challenges we are living right now in Mexico. However, I continue with good practices for Objective 16 in terms of inclusion and social cohesion. We have some double, double nationality campaigns, also culture and peace, holistic um, assistance for women, uh, voting for Mexican nationals abroad, and all these activities help migrants to be empowered and to contribute in the society they live in. In conclusion, in terms of remittances and economic inclusion, Mexico plays an important role in remittances, as you know, remittances from the states to Mexico were more than $51,000 million, and it was, this was an increase even if the, the, the crisis figures were better than the previous year. We have specific offices for remittances with the Banco de Mexico. We also have specific programs for ID specifically for nationals, but also for uh, those people in transit. We are compiling these good practices since 2017, and we have two big challenges. One, remittances, remittances and also the social security system. I'm not saying we don't have good practices in those fields, but we are trying to improve that. We are focusing right now in order to give uh, a following up to all these activities. We also share these good practices in the platform. In conclusion, 
by the end of March, we'll be doing a workshop in our regional conference before the forum. And we'll be there as a region. It, we have a lot more to share, but I'm afraid I don't have the time right now. So thank you very much. And I'm available for you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mexico. And uh, now the floor to the representative of Portugal, followed by Ecuador. Portugal floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carlos Oliveira, and uh, thank you for the organization of this meeting. I would start off uh, referring to the objective 14, and Portugal considers of paramount importance the, for the successful integration of migrants that they are able to uh, uh, enjoy the right of family, family reunion. In this regard, recent uh, agreements that have been negotiated with India and Morocco uh, lay out this right for migrants to, um, to apply for the right to uh, family reunion. We think this is uh, of paramount importance for the successful integration uh, in Portugal. Uh, regarding objective 15 uh, and, the, and the provision of access to basic services, in Portugal there are currently four main national support centers for the integration of migrants, which uh, aim to be a one-shop uh, one uh, services where migrants can get information about health, uh, in, uh, immigration, social security, justice and finance. In these four um, in these four main centers, the national support centers um, provide information and mediation services to migrants in different languages, irrespective of the legal status they may have in Portugal and free of charge. The, uh, alongside these four main national support centers, there exists a network of 140 local support centers for the integration of migrants, uh, which seeks to uh, get on board municipalities, civil society organizations, and higher education institutions. The, the network provides decentralized information and support to migrants in their local context. Uh, the High Commission uh, uh, for Migration in Portugal also provides uh, a free telephone translation services uh, that connects the migrants with different services of the public administration in Portugal. Uh, the services have been widely used within and outside AC, uh, the High Commission, High Commission for Migration Services, allowing translations in 69 languages with the help of 107 translators. In, tw in last year, this service made 2,149 translations, six 631 were related with access to health services. Uh, going, moving on to objective 16, um, Portugal uh, also promotes, uh, with, the, with the cooperation of High Commission and municipalities, uh, consultations uh, regarding uh, policy for, migration, for migrants, uh, with the help of bringing everyone on board in a consultative process, uh, so that specific measures are tailored to the necessities of the migrants. We also support the work of the, the immigrant associations that exist in Portugal, empowering, we consider empowering tools for, for the migrants, uh, for the migrant integration. We bring, a, uh, they bring a significant contribution to this process and help develop and empower migrant, uh, migrants activities in Portugal and in the local community they serve. Uh, the High Commission for Migration in Portugal has given a long uh, since 2004 uh, support to this immigrant association, providing technical and financial support, which has been considered a high priority policy area uh, in supporting the integration of migrants. Uh, finally, moving on to Objective 22, I just like to point out that uh, Portugal considers the, the negotiation of social security agreements with other countries uh, also uh, very important to ensure the, uh, the applicable legislation in Portugal is uh, also used in other countries and that when they return, they also do not lose their rights. In this uh, regard, uh, this is fundamental for their protection. Uh, Portugal has concluded bilateral social agreements with 20 countries as of today. 
and is also bound by two multilateral agreements, one uh, with Ibero-American Ibero and within the community of Portuguese-speaking countries. Agreements with other countries are also ongoing. Uh, negotiations are also ongoing with other countries. In the context of COVID-19 pandemic, Portugal has granted temporary extension of documents and visas to enable migrants to stay in our country, allowing access to health, housing, social security, and, and employment stability. This measure ensures equal rights and opportunities for all citizens, regardless of their origin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Portugal. And now the floor to the representative of Ecuador, followed by United Arab Emirates. Ecuador, please, floor is yours. Muchas gracias por darme la palabra. Thank you very much. Dear participants, organizations, states, social, civil society, and other stakeholders, greetings from Ecuador government. According to the, these objectives, we've done several actions. I will refer to objective 14 for consular protection. Ecuador gives protection, assistance to diaspora, as is in the law, in a national law, and also in our framework. We prioritize support to returnees. That's why during the pandemic, more than 2,000 nationals from Ecuador could come back to the country. We also strengthen our capacities as we provide services through a portal, an online portal, which allows nationals and also migrants to have access to services in Ecuador and also outside Ecuador. Objective 15, access to basic services. Our laws guarantee access to education, health, regardless of the uh, migrant status. Our government, although the lack of resources, has more than 40,000 students from Venezuela in our schools and we attended more than a million people at hospitals, regardless of their status. It's a, we show our commitment to be a champion country in the GCM. This means more than $100 million, but it's an important collaboration with the help of uh, institutions and also other partnerships. We also support the process of vaccination regardless of the migrant status. Ecuador provided both to nationals and also migrants at least one dose. In some cases, we provided two and we are studying the third dose. Moving to objective 16, Ecuador implemented some actions in terms of human mobility tables. This is a mechanism we have since 2018 as a dialogue and cooperation and participation in order to design public policies for migrants in mobility. It also includes the protection of rights from Equatorian nationals abroad and also for migrants in our country. In terms of objective 19, we have several programs for supporting returnees so that they can stay in the country and generate means for survival and to increase their wellness. Thank you very much for the opportunity and I'm sorry if I exceeded my time. Thank you. Thank you 
Thank you very much, uh, Ecuador. And now the representative of United uh, Arab Emirates and uh, followed by Cambodia. Thank you for giving me the floor. Um, given the limited time available, allow me to focus on objectives 15, 16, 20, and 22. The UAE is the fifth largest migrant destination in the world and has the highest per capita migrant population of any country. The UAE offers migrants from developing countries safe, orderly, and regular migration pathways. This not only contributes to the economic and social development of the UAE, but provides a vital flow of remittances. The UAE works to ensure that no one is barred from accessing basic services. Emergency medical treatment is available to all, regardless of status or capacity to pay, and patients will never be denied emergency care. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Pandemic, the UAE took the decision to offer treatment of the disease free to all regardless of residency status or insurance coverage. The UAE rolled out one of the fastest and most successful vaccination campaigns in the world with vaccines offered free on a walk-in basis and regular free testing campaigns have been undertaken without regard to residency status. As one of the world's most diverse societies, the UAE places significant emphasis on social cohesion. In 2016, the UAE cabinet established the Ministry of Tolerance and Coexistence. In the same year, the cabinet launched the National Tolerance Program to boost values of coexistence and to fight discriminatory attitudes and beliefs. The UAE has established numerous initiatives to facilitate tolerance and coexistence. For example, 2019 was the UAE's year of tolerance. The Ministry of Tolerance and Coexistence also sponsors a seven-day annual national festival of tolerance to promote key values. Multiple communities organized to enable individuals to access assistance and advice on migration, integration, and rights. With regards to Objective 20, it is important to note that the UAE is the second largest source of remittances after the United States, with migrant workers remitting 43.24 billion US dollars in 2020, according to the World Bank. And that represents a 12.2% share of the UAE's GDP. The costs of remitting money from the UAE are among the lowest in the world, in line with SDG 10.C. The UAE promotes financial literacy for migrant workers as part of its comprehensive information and orientation program, with a particular focus on domestic workers. Significant efforts have also been made to promote private sector financial services that are specifically tailored to lower skilled migrant workers. Finally, on Objective 22, we would note that portability of benefits is extreme, extremely important for workers in the UAE, given that most will return home at the end of their employment. All workers who have completed one year of employment are entitled to an end of service gratuity, calculated on the basis of the worker's final basic salary. Since 2018, the UAE has been introducing an insurance-based product to cover the payment of end of service benefits in cases of employer insolvency. The Tetmin insurance policy costs 60 dirhams per person insured and provides coverages valued up to 20,000 dirhams against non-payment of entitlements. The UAE government has robust mechanisms in place to ensure that workers receive their entitlements and can seek redress where these are in dispute. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, United Arab Emirates. And now the representative of Cambodia, please, floor is yours. Yeah, I thank you so much, Mr. Chairperson. On behalf of the Royal Government of Cambodia, I work in Cambodia on migration issues. According to the Objective 14, the legal identity of migrants is very important to protect them from any risk and exploitation. The legalization of the existing of more than 1 million undocumented or lack of full document Cambodian migrant workers in Thailand was able to operate by the collaboration collaboration between Cambodia and Thailand, relevant authority as the sending and receiving country. The mechanism should be Cambodia. both sides. Otherwise, really the process cannot be successful. Cambodia, really sorry to interrupt you, but the... According uh, to the objective, I'm sorry. Cambodia, the yeah. line is very disturbed. We can hardly hear you. Yeah. Can I'm we, sorry. Can we give another try? Otherwise, we can. Uh, you cannot you. hear? Now, better. Cannot please. hear? I'm sorry. Uh, not, not well. Not well, I'm afraid. 
Can you try once more? I'm sorry. So maybe later after that, after no, this. No, now it's better. Now it's better. If you keep yes. this, it's better. I see. Please, I see. Please go ahead. So thank you again. Thank you again. The the legal identity according to objective 14 the legal identity of migrant is very important to protect them from any risk of exploitation as experienced in 2019 the legalization of the existing of more than one million undocumented of lack of full migrant document Cambodian migrant in Thailand was able to operate by the collaboration between Cambodia and Thailand. Cambodia. Cambodia. Yes. I'm sorry again. Really. You cannot I'm hear me. Really, no, it's a, it's yes. a really yes, bad yes. Can we? Can I propose that we move on with the other speaker and give you time to uh, check your connectivity to uh, resume in a in a little while? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your understanding. Uh, and uh, now um, I would like to move to the representative of European uh, Commission. Uh, please, uh, floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Mr. Chair, and I hope you can hear me well. I speak on behalf of the European Commission and the European External Action Service today. Um, so migrants and EU citizens with a migrant background play a key role in the European economy and society, and the COVID-19 crisis has made their contribution all the more evident. And it's therefore a moral duty as well as an economic imperative to promote their integration and inclusion. In November 2020, the European Commission announced its EU action plan on integration and inc inclusion. The action plan proposes targeted and tailored support that takes into account individual characteristics, supporting member states through funding, developing guidance and fostering partnerships with all of those involved. Empowering both migrants and host communities to actively engage in the integration process is essential to achieve sustainable and successful integration. And the Commission will build on successful examples of cooperation, such as the partnership on the inclusion of migrants and refugees under the urban agenda for the EU, the European Partnership for Integration with Social and Economic Parties, and a partnership with rural regions. Insufficient access to healthcare services can be a major obstacle to integration and inclusion, affecting virtually all areas of life. The European Commission is promoting access to healthcare services for migrants, working with member states to foster equal access to quality and affordable healthcare services. The Commission has launched an expert group on the views of migrants composed of migrants themselves and organizations representing their interests and will consult in the design and implementation of future EU policies in the field of migration, asylum and integration. The Commission will also finance projects to increase the active participation at national, regional and local level. Now quickly coming to objective 19 and 20, the EU knows how the important diaspora links between host and home countries are for development. We have recognized this through our EU consensus on development, the external dimensions of the new pact on migration and asylum, and our financial instrument for 21-27 in our external cooperation. Um, Diaspora Development Organizations, too, are members of the Policy Forum on Development, the Commission's Permanent Dialogue Forum on Development Matters with civil society and local authorities. Through the EU-funded uh, EU Global Diaspora Facility, we assist diaspora organizations in Europe, countries of origin and the EU to engage and collaborate more effectively with each other. We are committed to achievement of SDG 10, on reducing remittances cost to 3% by 2030. We estimate that reaching this goal would result at EU level at least in saving 1.5 billion euros in transaction fees every year. And there is already some progress with a reduction of 2% in average costs of sending remittances since the SDG approval. 
The EU supports several initiatives on remittances. For example, the EU-funded Prime Africa initiative implemented by IFAD supports innovative businesses, initiatives in Africa on remittances and promoting digitalization and financial inclusion. The Commission is also launching a global report, Math Pink Migrants Investment Schemes and supports NOMAD, the World Bank Migration Knowledge Partnership that also works on remittances. We have supported the efforts of our partners during the COVID pandemic towards the greatest use of digital transfers that are more agile, cheaper, and integrate the formal economy. There is a positive trend that needs to be further encouraged. I thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for giving us the floor. Thank you. Thank you, European Commission. Um... Cambodia, uh, are you ready to try if uh, now the connection is better? Cambodia, are you hearing us? I'm afraid that problems are not solved, so... With your permission, I would like to continue with the other um, speakers. So I'm passing the floor to Education International, followed by PICUM. Thank you very much. Education International is grateful for the opportunity to participate today as part of the Council of Global Unions, representing over 200 million workers globally, guided by the human rights-based approach to ensure all migrants lead fulfilling lives. Education International is the Global Union Federation, representing more than 32 million educators and champions equitable and free access to inclusive, quality, and holistic public education. Though we welcome the progress documented, there are remain many challenges in ensuring the fundamental right. One being government underinvestment in education. Investing in the teacher workforce through recruitment and training allows educators to better meet the needs of migrant students. However, I'd like to spotlight some of the work educators and their unions have been doing towards objectives 15 and 16 despite this. To strengthen the capacities of education systems to meet objective 15 and address the impact of the pandemic, Education International and our affiliates have been calling on all governments to conduct educational equity audits. These audits can inform recovery plans and help address the exacerbated inequities facing migrant students. Such equity audits are most effective when they are planned and implemented through a participatory process. As the compact champions a whole of society approach, educators and their unions are best placed to help design solutions for an inclusive recovery and must not, let, must not be left on the sidelines. Secondly, Education International would like to highlight the critical work educators and their unions are doing to address objective 16 regarding social inclusion. Uh, regarding social cohesion. As schools are one of the main ways migrant youth interact with host society, they are critical actors in creating socially cohesive communities and tackling discriminatory discourses. Education unions have been developing advocacy strategies to promote more inclusive schools in the context of rising anti-migrant sentiments. We will be sharing related material on the practice repository that provides examples of practical action, strategies, and advice for better facilitating migrant inclusion in education. In the lead up to the IMRF, Education International calls for all stakeholders to put education at the forefront of migrant inclusion policy and engage meaningfully with unions to meet the objectives of the GCN. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you, uh, Education International. Now floors to PICUM. Thank you very much for the opportunity. One of the hallmarks of the Global Compact on Migration is that it recognizes that access to services should be for all migrants, regardless of status, in Objective 15. This was actually reiterated recently in the Secretary General's report in paragraph 98, and it also really refers to access to health care there. So some of the positive news is that we can learn from countries that have legislation um, that enable access to health care for undocumented migrants. Belgium, France, and Italy each have more than 20 years of experience because Belgium's legislation is from 1996, Italy's is from 1998, and France's is from 1999. Sweden also has 
legislation from 2013. So nine years of experience, um, in addition to the countries that have already spoken at this roundtable, talking about enabling access to healthcare for undocumented migrants. But even when this legislation is in place, which is definitely a first step, we still have to make sure that migrants' personal data won't be transmitted to immigration authorities. And one of the best, robust, comprehensive recommendations that governments can look to is the Council of Europe's ECRI General Policy Recommendation 16 on safeguarding irregularly present migrants from discrimination. But to also complement what the European Commission just said in its intervention, the European Commission itself is also advising EU member states to really fully implement relevant legislation and enable undocumented migrants to have access to healthcare um, and justice. So in June 2020, in the Victims' Rights Strategy, the European Commission explicitly recognized that undocumented migrants are vulnerable to victimization, but that the EU Victims Directive, which is applicable to 27 EU member states except Denmark, should be implemented in a non-discriminatory way. So the Commission calls on EU member states as part of the Victims' Rights Strategy of the EU to exchange good practices on safe reporting of crime. And in September, September 2021, on the communication on the employer sanctions directive, the European Commission recognized that undocumented workers can be deterred from filing complaints against exploitative employers due to the risks of immigration enforcement. So the Commission calls on EU member states to enable safe reporting, including to access to labor inspectors. Also on the national level, Germany in the December 2021 coalition agreement of the new government includes a pledge to abolish the, the obligation for healthcare providers to report undocumented patients to immigration authorities. And we also have ample evidence. We've heard this from several countries already so far about the COVID-19 uh, vaccination for undocumented migrants. We have uh, two investigative journalism outfits in Europe, the Lighthouse Reports and the Bureau for Investigative Journalism, that each looked at several countries in Europe and how they rolled out the COVID-19 vaccination for undocumented so to conclude, we have ample evidence, we have ample experience uh, from states, from researchers, from civil society, that enabling undocumented migrants access to health care is possible and it's practical, but we need to make sure that there's no personal data transferred. And we would also be interested in cities. There's the city initiative on irregular migrants that's uh, involving up to 50 cities in Europe that now can provide an important um, insight in this. And when governments are doing their voluntary national reports in the coming months, we urge national level governments to reach out to cities, to civil society, to try to find solutions on this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Picum. And now I would like to uh, try again to go back to the representative of Cambodia, if um, uh, she can connect with us. Cambodia, Do can you, you hear me? I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot open the uh, video, but can you hear me? Yes. I see. Please so, go ahead. I thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much again, and uh, I would like to share my opinion. And uh, the experiences so far. So according to the Objective 14, the legal identity for migrants is very important for protect them from any risk of exploitation. As I experienced in 2019, the legalization of the existing of more than 1 million undocumented and lack of full document Cambodian migrants in Thailand was able to operate by the collaboration between Cambodia and Thailand and relevant authority as the sending and receiving country. The mechanism should be concerned both sides, otherwise, the process cannot be successful. According to the the 15, as you may aware that Cambodia is a sending country, but also a destination for foreign workers from various countries. During COVID-19, 
the Raya government of Cambodia has educated people to apply prevention measure called Sridu Sridan and provide vaccination to citizens and not only Cambodian people but also for foreigners and free of charge. Every Everyone can apply the fundamental dose and also continue to have booster dose after Cambodia just endorsed migrant health policy and their support. It is a comprehensive model of social exclusive, inclusive health. Cambodia, I'm afraid we lost you totally this time. Uh, I would like to suggest if uh, uh, you can hear us, uh, but the team, the secretary will follow up on that. Probably the best is submit the uh, test of your intervention in written and we will share with all audience. So we are not going to lose your contribution. Uh, then uh, before to go back to the list, um, I also have a representative from Honduras that uh, is here. Please, Honduras, you can get the floor. Hola, muy buenos días. Hello, good, very good afternoon to you all, or good day to you all. Thank you so much for having invited us to take part in this exercise of examining the objectives of the compact. And so we're obviously in the Northern Triangle of Central America. We're a country that is also an origin country, but a transit country as well for um, migrants. Also, you know, we're talking about, you know, Venezuelans, Cubans, Nicaraguan people, amongst others who come through our national territory. And so in that vein, we're trying to revise and also ask countries in the region whether they can contribute in terms of protection of people who are in transit, because we've seen how governments have developed different actions within the framework of a policy that would provide, that would be part of the national security policy. And I think that we really need to now ask for them to be protected under the right to respect of human rights. And so what's really important is we've seen iman immense human suffering. And I think we really have to change this narrative of this, why our brothers and sisters are um, neighbors or compatriots for that matter, are actually leaving our res respective countries, whether it's to do with situations of corruption and um, drug dealing or um, basically mm, not illegally um, or mishandled resources of the state. And so we know that the objectives of the Global Compact or the PAC, Global Pact on Migration could be brought towards um, local governments and we have to associate these. But I think that over and above associating these things, we need to find ways in which we can allow local governments to basically ma materialize these um, facts so as to get to tackling the structural um, reasons that cause people to migrate. And I think that we are part of the Amparo network, which uh, is a network that also carries out lobbying um, in against the US government and also we're part of the US bloc and we've come together and so as to be able to carry out these lobbying activities and to basically boost each other's efforts and we're all trying to work together as civil society organizations we hope that we'll be able to at least denounce constant violations of human rights of our country men and women and I would like to thank you very much for having given me this forum, this space to talk. And I think that as my organization, just to say that we are contributing in this review and that as 
an organisation, we actually do help uh, returned migrant, um, the returned migrant population. Um, we help them with psychological support as well as immediate humanitarian assistance. But we also have a process for school reinsertion, family reunification, and we're also trying with to work with a network of young returnee immigrants and what they have to do to integrate themselves nationally and regionally. And so I would like to say that nowadays, you know, you really do need to have young people's participation as well if you want to actually try to uh, tackle the root causes and structural causes of the migration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honduras. And uh, I'm going back to the um, list of speaker with a request. Please use the uh, chat um, box because raising the hand, uh, you're going to be missed. We, we don't have the full picture uh, of all hands uh, raised on, on the screen. So please uh, put forward your request to speak on the, on the, on the chat. Um, I would like to follow with the uh, NGO Committee on Migration, followed by uh, Public Service International. NGO Committee on Migration, please, floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, sir. Two minutes. Um, for world, real world and rights-based development, for solutions and to achieve both the SDGs and the GCM, we'd like to speak to the intersection of GCM objectives 19, on empowering migrants and diaspora for development, 20 for on remittances and 22 on portability of earned benefits. The World Bank tells us of well over 500 billion US dollars that migrants and diaspora have contributed each year for many years in recorded remittances that they send home from their earnings to their families and communities in low and middle income countries. But what about the earnings that migrants and diaspora are not paid? What we have seen before COVID, during COVID, and know that we will have to address beyond COVID is the millions upon millions of dollars that employers owe to migrant and diaspora for work that they've done, but the employers refuse to pay them for. These unpaid earnings, these unpaid earnings are actually missing remittances. They're missing remittances that migrants and diaspora would have sent or brought back to countries of origin, to their families and communities that need them and have a right to them. This widespread, widespread wage theft violates rights, hurts families, reduces remittances and development, and weakens low-income economies. Working with states on mechanisms, on mechanisms to recover those earned wages is a major priority of the NGO Committee on Migration. It is also a priority of our civil society colleagues worldwide, led by Migrant Forum in Asia, trade unions, and migrant organizations. Over 150 NGOs have signed onto this priority within the new Global Unified Civil Society Statement, the 12 key ways for the IMRF. GCM objectives 19, 20, and 22 clearly intersect on this issue, and all of us must too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, floors to Public Service International and Prepare Migrant International. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on behalf of PSI, the Global Union Federation of Public Service Workers, and we are also part of the Council of Global Unions. I will speak today on Objective 15 and on also on Objective 22. On Objective 15, Crucial to migrants' access to services is their full and non-discriminatory access to inclusive and quality public services, which deliver on the human right to health, education, social care, public infrastructure, safe water, and sanitation, among others. Public service workers are the ones who deliver these services from the national to subnational levels, such as cities and municipalities. 
PSI unions represent these workers, which include among them migrant workers. We have seen in pandemic and climate disasters the critical importance of well-funded and functioning public services and how public service workers have been risking their lives to keep society functioning in the midst of the crisis and in the recovery efforts. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown why universal health coverage is our ultimate goal, which the SDGs and the Global Compact on Migration are in full alignment in ensuring that everyone has access to life-saving treatment and to the vaccines. On the issue of vaccines, PSI has been leading the global campaign for the TRIPS waiver to make vaccine production accessible to developing countries. Crucial to UHC is human resources for health for all countries. The pandemic has shown the vital need for adequate numbers of health workers to deliver health care. It also highlighted the important role and contribution that migrant health workers have made to the COVID-19 response. Unfortunately, however, among the highest number of infections and deaths were suffered by migrant health and care workers, a majority of whom are women. PSI unions are at the front lines in representing health and care workers and rectifying these injustices. PSI fully supports the human rights of all migrants to access quality public services. Within our unions, we support the establishment of firewalls, separating access to health and other public services from immigration control, and we advocate that public service workers providing services and assistance to undocumented migrants should not be penalized or criminalized for doing so. In Europe, our European organization, the EPSU, has established the EU Care Network, where unions organizing workers involved in the reception and care services are able to exchange experiences, engage in social dialogue and advocacy on migrant and refugee rights, including in the reform of the EU asylum and migration policy. On Objective 22, and this is my last uh, sentence, PSI believes that access to and portability of social security for migrant workers must be guaranteed and governed by multilateral or bilateral agreements and in line with international human rights norms and labor standards. We commend the efforts of a number of countries that I've shared today and also uh, in their reports that have done so already, as well as the resolution adopted by the International Labor Conference that include recommendations on portability of social protections. These are all steps in the right direction and member states and all stakeholders can certainly do more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, PSI. Now, floors to Migrante International. Good evening from the Philippines and thank you. My name is Joanna Concepcion, chairperson of Migrante International. We are a grassroots uh, global alliance of Filipino migrant o uh, organizations in over 24 countries. Our members include human trafficking survivors, domestic workers, healthcare workers, seafarers, laborers, and undocumented migrants. For Filipino migrant workers, the, di the diminishing role of state accountability and weakening government regulation in ensuring social and welfare protection and provision of social services for our migrant workers has only worsened their plight and made them even more vulnerable to further exploitation. Our consulates overseas should serve as the front lines of providing immediate, adequate, and comprehensive responses to appeals for assistance and support to our distressed migrants overseas. And yet, they lack the machinery, the resources, and the personnel. The lack of budget each year allocated by our national government not only reflects the deprioritization of funding critical services for our distressed migrants, but essentially adopting a policy of privatizing these services where the burden of responsibility and cost of social protection is relegated to private recruitment agencies, companies and employers, and even the migrants themselves. Implementing government policies such as compulsory insurance coverages, mandatory paid membership schemes, just to access social benefits, programs, and assistance are at no or limited cost to the government, but weigh heavily on our migrants, especially when they have difficulty accessing these benefits, when their employers forcibly deduct the cost from their paychecks, and weak government enforcement. At the height of the pandemic until now, we have assisted countless migrant workers, both land and sea-based, completely abandoned by their employers, companies, and agencies at a time when they are seeking to access those very urgent services, protection, and assistance, leaving them stranded, sick, hungry, homeless, and in debt 
taking to task our consulates to take action. Lastly, it is an injustice that we are often seen or valued primarily for our economic contributions, the remittances we send, or even profit that can be earned from our hard-earned, relatively low wages and sacrifices. For us, genuine recognition and protection of our rights requires stronger, not diminished, state accountability. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Migrante International. It's uh, with a really uh, a bit of uh, frustration, a big sorry, that uh, we need to uh, stop the open floor for intervention uh, from the audience. Uh, we have a time limit uh, for this session and uh, also for uh, translation. So I would like to kindly request uh, any other uh, intention of interventions, please do submit to us in written your intervention. We will uh, make it public on, uh, on, uh, on the website and uh, we'll make sure that all the audience is going to um, receive uh, your own uh, proposals. I would like to um, by now close this really exciting uh, session I was uh, really impressed by the quality and comprehensiveness of the contribution of the speaker in the panel, uh, bringing us really a, a picture on the situation, a reality check, country, community level, and engagement of youth networks. But then was uh, absolutely overwhelming the contribution from the audience, really gave in one hand very clear uh, feeling that we are uh, progressing, we are moving. The GCM implementation certainly is uh, uh, present in our life, in our work uh, situation in terms of uh, uh, really asking for uh, further engagement, but also showing already uh, an enormous amount of uh, good practice and, and uh, changes and uh, advancement. At the same time, uh, a number of challenges emerged. Uh, those challenges will be certainly reflected and brought into discussion of the MRF. Uh, there was a lot of reference, naturally, to the pandemic context, how uh, we dealt with that special situation, how we dealt with the challenge. And again, it was extremely interesting to see uh, different realities, how many uh, countries uh, really identify the pragmatic approach of having an inclusive uh, approach uh, in accessing services for the entire population, including migrants in a regular situation. And uh, again, the monitoring, the observation, the study done by group uh, here in the, in the session showed that more need to be done. So even there, uh, there, there are a lot of good practice, a lot of intentions, and just to quote one of the speaker, political commitments, but probably uh, more need to be done or more is needed in order to define the situation ideal. I would like to conclude again by thank you all for uh, your contribution and participation and uh, looking forward to the next round table and to the uh, sessions at the MRF. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, Santino. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Hi, this is Anisur from Bangladesh. Goodbye.